Okay, so I hope you can all see my screen and my slides. So, okay, so again, thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk about, uh, okay, before that, so uh, feel free to unmute yourself and shout out your question at any point uh, if you get lost and so on. Uh, it's a great pleasure to get back to CMU. I was visiting here uh, back to 2018, working with Venkat Guruswami on some uh, least decoding problem. And I guess after that, I got somewhat obsessed with that and uh, got some results in the next few years. And uh, it was uh, a nice subject, I think. So today I'm going to report some uh, a recent line of work on understanding various uh, threshold phenomena and more in adversarial information theory and coding theory broadly defined using the notion of complete positivity. I'm going to define CP uh, properly. I mean, by CP, I'm referring to complete positivity and show you the power of it. So uh, this is based, everything that I talked about that is new is based on joint work or non-joint work by uh, different subsets of the following people, Andre Bogdanov, Amit Bud Kulay, Siddharth Jaggi, Mike Langberg and Nicholas Vaughn and myself for some of the results. So, uh, in case you get bored, I'm going to start off with a puzzle. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing. Let me try to formalize it properly. So let's say I give you some finite alphabet and every random variable I'm going to talk about is over that finite alphabet. Okay, now, now I give you some distribution P of W1, W2, W3 on three random variables. The goal is for you to construct an arbitrarily long sequence of variables x1, 2, 3, and so on. So that if you take out any three variables, i less than j less than k, the marginal xi, xj, xk is equal to the distribution I gave you, p, w1, w2, w3. And the question is that, can you do this? When can you do this? So because this is a question, it's clear that it's not always doable. It depends on what kind of distribution p, w1, w2, w3 I gave you. And the goal is to classify the distributions. For what family of distributions is it possible? Otherwise, is it pos is impossible? I'm going to give you the answer right away. Uh, so the answer is that this is uh, if and only if this distribution is completely positive, CP. What does that mean? That means this triple W123 can be written as a mixture of product distributions like product uh, variables. Namely, it can be decomposed as a convex combination of uh, like PI tensor three, the outer product of PI with itself three times. And these lambda i's are just non-negative and sum up to one, right? This is some special family of distributions. And I call this family of distribution CP, okay? Now I give you the answer, but uh, this is on the face of it, a purely probability theoretic statement, but our proof, which you will see later in the talk, is actually combinatorial. It sounds weird uh, at the first class. And we don't know a purely probability theoretic proof of this simple statement, similarly simple, simple state statement. And if you can do that, that will be nice. Secondly, uh, I said that the alphabet of all random variables are over the same alphabet, which is finite. And we don't know how to do it for say continuous random variables. And I think if you can do that, first of all, I do think uh, something like this is also true for continuous random variables. Uh, of course, we have to define CP properly. And if you can do that, I think it should have some consequences in combinatorics, which I'm not going to touch upon in this talk, but I believe that's interesting and kind of important. Uh, okay, let me jump right into the topic of this, real topic of this talk. The motivation for us to study this weird stuff comes from uh, list decoding. Uh, some of you might heard of this. So what is list decoding in the classical setting? I'm first going to introduce this in the classical coding theory uh, notion, under the classical coding theory notion. Uh, there are various versions of the definition. I'm going to present the more information theoretic version, which turns out to be more favorable for us to, uh, if we want to generalize things later on. So uh, here it's the background of this problem is communication. Like uh, there are two parties, Alice, Alice and Bob. They want to, I mean, Alice wants to communicate some message to Bob 
like one way, some message M, which takes value in some finite uh, set of size two to the NR. This parameterization, I'm emphasizing the exponent R. Uh, that's the, you know, the normalized size of the set of messages, which is the most important quantity I care about. This is something called the rate of the communication or the rate of the code uh, that I want to maximize. Uh, now, because the channel from Alice to Bob is noisy, uh, Alice had not better uh, you know, transmit the message per se, but encode it in some way to a longer sequence X of length N, for now, let's say binary, and transmit it into the channel. Let's collect all, you know, each message corresponds to, has, has one encoding, and let's collect all such encodings and call it a code book that's denoted by C. And that sequence is fed into a channel, uh, an XOR channel, actually. The channel also takes another input from an adversary. I mean, the channel is governed by, the, by, by an adversary who can inject some noise vector S, also binary, of having weight at most MP for some uh, number P between zero and one. And that's, you know, I put some weight constraints onto the vector S. And the channel just takes these two vectors, X and S, and output some Y, which is nothing but the sum of X and S modulo two. And the decoder given, uh, a given Y wants to output the nearest L code words in C around Y, okay? And ideally, I want it to be the case that this small list of size L contains the correct X, okay? I mean, because M and X has a one-to-one -one mapping, so I can also alternatively talk about X instead of M, it doesn't matter. So you see that, so I, first of all, I hope this setup is clear. Uh, and secondly, this problem is you know, purely combinatorial. There's no probability at all. This is everything's worst case. Right, so that's uh, the so-called least decoding problem in a channel coding perspective. So a better, I mean, probably you prefer this representation. So it actually not, it's not easy to see, sorry, it's not hard to see that it's equivalent to the following geometric problem. Let's start it off with L equals one, the least size equals one. It's like this. We have some Hamming space, like, I mean, binary space zero one to the N and we have a bunch of Hamming balls, each of radius MP, uh, centered around a bunch of points, like those black points. They are actually the code words. For this, I mean, for this configuration to be good, I want those balls to be disjoint, right? And this configuration is called a sphere packing in Hamming space, or you know, a good code, uh, a good uniquely decodable code. Now, given this kind of problem, I said that the goal is to maximize the rate or the, you know, the density of the packing. Uh, the best possible rate or the best possible density as a function of P uh, is some number. Actually, that is widely open, but it's some number depending on P, the largest possible rate. Oh, by the way, I call the largest achievable rate the capacity. And maybe the first basic question to ask is that that function uh, sorry, that number as a function of P, how does it behave? Uh, firstly, it certainly uh, decreases as P increase because if the radius of the ball uh, gets larger and larger, it's harder and harder to pack more and more balls. Uh, so then we can ask, what's the largest possible P so that the density is positive? Or what's the you know, smallest possible P so that the rate hits zero? the largest possible rate hits zero. I'm going to keep calling that point, special point P star, the threshold or the plot king point for some reason. And I mean, uh, I care about the capacity, but here I'm asking for the zeroth order characterization of the capacity in some sense. I'm just asking when is it positive? I'm not even care about for now, what's the actual value of the capacity? So the answer turns out to be one fourth, uh, you know, which is the radius of the ball. And this is actually a characterization in the sense that if you, if the ball's radius is slightly below one fourth, you can put in exponentially many points, exponential meaning two to the n times some constant. Otherwise, if P is slightly larger than one fourth, let's say uh, one fourth plus epsilon, 
it turns out that you can only pack sub exponentially many points. In fact, you can only pack finitely many points. Finite meaning that O of one independent of the dimension n. So this is a sharp transition in terms of you know, the number of points you can pack. Now, this is so far for unique decoding or uh, you know, one list decoding, the list size is one. We can increase the list size a little bit. Geometrically, what does it mean? It means that I allow overlap now, but not too much in the sense that for any point in the space, let's say here, it must lies in the intersection of at most two balls. And this is true for any point in this Hamming space. So if this is the case, then I call such a configuration a two packing or two least decodable code. Now, again, for now, I only care about the threshold. Let's ask again, what's the threshold P so that you can achieve positive rate? This turns out to be again, one false. And it's also tight. So let's increase the list size further. You know, this kind of question makes sense for any L, finite L. So for three packing, it's, it turns out to jump to some strange number five over 16. For four, it remains. For five, it jumps again to some strange number 11 over 32. And for six, it stays again. So you may already see the pattern. It seems to jump every two times. In fact, there's a formula for it. I'm going to give, you, uh, give it to you later. But before that, let's uh, first uh, understand what it means. What does it mean for it to be non-least decodable, right? Let's, uh, let's look at two least decodable code. Uh, this I claim is a bad code for two least decoding because I can find three balls so that you can stick in one point here, which lies in the intersection of three balls. That's a bad thing because if you draw a ball of radius MP around that point, that center, this ball captures three code words and three is larger than two. So it's not too least decodable. Geometrically, I think it's, I hope it's clear. Okay, so uh, now what does it mean? I mean, what does it mean uh, channel coding wise? It means back to the channel, uh, channel model. It means that we can find three code words and three noise vectors, S1, S2, S3, each of uh, length, I mean, each of Hamming weight at most MP, so that the sum of X1, S1, and the sum of X2, S2, sum of X3, X, S3, modulo two, are all equal to some vector Y. And this Y is just the center, the pink center I drew in the previous slide. Okay, so far it seems nothing but triviality, but this kind of perspective, I claim that it's uh, helpful if we look at things from this perspective and it, uh, if we want to general, generalize things. Okay, now back to the threshold problem. Uh, this is the formula. I claim that there okay, you can achieve positive rate for uh, PL minus one list decoding or PL minus one packing if P is less than this threshold. And you see, this is the same for L, B, and 2K and 2K plus one. So it, it does jump to every two, every two times. And further, if you increase L, this number is going from one fourth to a half, uh, right? This was first discovered by Blinovsky in 1986 and later was rediscovered by Polyansky in, 19, uh, in 2016 and re-rediscovered by Noga Long, Boris Book, and Yuri Polyansky in 2018. Uh, so this seems to be pretty well known. Now, even slightly more general than this, let's say, let's consider the following uh, twisted question. I further require that each code word uh, that can be transmitted has Hamming weight at most NW. Now there's one more fact, one more parameter W for some, you know, let's say a fixed W and ask again, what's the threshold P star so that, you know, you can pack exponentially many points or you can achieve positive rate. The threshold now becomes already becomes a bit more nasty. It's given by this. Uh, I'm not sure if this is new or old, probably it's hidden somewhere in the literature, but you can derive this from our general results. And uh, I mean, my, my point is that it's not, I don't think it's super easy to uh, derive it, uh, you know, directly. And now you lose the periodicity, like it doesn't jump every two times. It's different for every L. Okay, just some uh, slight generalization. And then you can ask maybe slightly more 
uh, general type of errors, say asymmetric errors. Let's say now the channel function is no longer uh, an XOR function, but it looks like this. It can only zero out bits, but cannot you know, flip zero to ones. So the figure looks like some Z. So people sometimes call this a Z channel. And the threshold here turns out to be W minus W to the L. Again, I'll, I'm working with some input constraint as well with input constraint W. Uh, this kind of thing actually turns out to be useful in some other context, for example, uh, like recently it was used to study some channel cooling problem with feedback uh, by Lebedev, Lebedev and Polyansky. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to touch upon that. Now, uh, we've seen several examples and uh, we know, I mean, I claimed several uh, threshold results for those problems. Now I'm going to uh, get to a pretty general framework and this is gonna be the model we are going to work with. And I think uh, this one, I mean, even uh, again, getting the right thing to, uh, to study is already the, a very big step, I think. So this is the thing I'm going to work with. It looks almost identical to the bit flip case, but uh, there are uh, two twists, I think. One is that I allow this channel function to be any function, not necessarily XOR. By any, I mean not uh, exactly any, but uh, this function takes two inputs, X and S, they are vectors, and generates one output Y. And the way it, do, it does that is that it acts on each coordinate in the same way. I apply the same function to each coordinate from one to N, right? So in some sense, uh, this is memoryless because it, you know, it acts on each coordinate independently. That's one twist, but uh, I allow any function, not necessarily any deterministic function. In fact, even if W is a probability distribution, uh, even if it contains randomness, many of the results are still generalizable, but it requires extra, extra work. So I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about that in this talk. Uh, and also these vectors x, because w is a general function, these vectors x, s, and y, they can be over general alphabets, but I insist them to be finite and discrete, uh, but they can be anything. Uh, and again, the goal is to list equal to some list of size L. I guess most importantly, uh, I want to impose constraints on x and s. The way I impose constraints is in terms of types. I want the type of X to be in some convex subset of distributions. Okay, for this to make sense, I need to introduce what type is. So a type associated to a vector is defined as this. Let's say I have some general alphabet, let's say ABC. I have some vector of length N over that alphabet. And the type of X is nothing but its histogram or its empirical distribution. I can count the fraction of A in X in this vector. I count fraction of B in this vector and so does C. This is gonna be, you know, these fractions are gonna be uh, non-negative and uh, sum up to one. So this is the empirical distribution of this vector, right? So I call this tau of X to be the type of X, okay? So it's super simple, nothing fancy here. And in general, if I have two, vectors, I can count, you know, if you view this from column wise, I can count what's the fraction of AA, AB, AC, BA, BB, BC, and so on in this uh, pair of uh, vectors. And that induces some uh, matrix or some joint distributions. Each entry is given by some IJ from this alphabet ABC, right? Like in this case, the fraction of BB is 0.14 and so on. This, you can view this as a joint distribution between two dummy random variables. And in general, if you have more vectors, the type of the joint type of these type of vectors is gonna be a tensor of order L. Let's say you have L vectors, right? It can be easily computed. So nothing fancy here. Now go back to this channel definition. The way I impose constraint is that I want the type of this sequence X to be in some convex subset of distributions. So type and distributions are almost the same, except that you know, types are induced by length and vectors. So there are some divisibility conditions 
Uh, each entry has to be something over n. Uh, so it's slightly more restrictive than distributions, but I claim they are not that not that different. You can, uh, you, if you take n to be infinity, it, it doesn't make any difference. And if this is the probability simplex on the input alphabet, recall that this sequence x is over some script x. And you have some convex subset, arbitrary convex subset lambda x in this probability simplex. I just want that. And you fix that. Uh, I want that the input vector has type in this set. And so does S. So James, uh, you know, this adversary's uh, vector has type in this predetermined uh, uh, subset, convex subset lambda S. So the channel is specified by W, this function, and this input constraint lambda X and this noise constraint lambda S. So this is going to be the model I'm going to work with. So specializing this to the binary case, this W is the XOR function. This lambda X, you can you know, recover the Hamming weight constraint using this because the Hamming weight just says that you know, the type of some binary sequence just consists of two entries, the fraction of ones and the fraction of zeros. And I just want the fraction of ones to be at most NW. And so does here, the fraction of ones is at most NP. So it's just a linear constraint on type. Uh, and in general, you can impose any constraints on type as long as you know it forms a polytope or convex set. So this is, I claim it's a pretty general uh, uh, framework. You will see how general it is later in the talk. And, uh, but it does include several important examples that uh, coding theorists like. For example, the deletion channel, because deletion channel is not memoryless. Once you delete things, you lose synchronization. So this W doesn't capture that phenomenon. But anyway, the threshold problem for deletion channel is still open. Um, actually, I think the best record, record is like 0.4 something, 2.5 uh, by Linkert and his collaborators, by Boris Book and Linkert and so on. And so, yeah, this is the thing I'm going to work with. And this is the question I want to answer. I give you this channel specified by these alphabets, these constraints, this channel function, and this desirable list size. The question is that when can we construct positive rate least decodable code, right? And I want to give you, I want uh, some uh, sufficient and necessary condition for this to be possible or impossible. So, and geometrically, it corresponds to some weird packing problem, you pack some general shapes defined induced by the channel. You can actually compute that in some product space x to the n. Actually, this x to the n does not even come with a metric. It doesn't, I don't, I don't require that. And in fact, uh, those shapes can even vary across points, you know, around each code where this shape may not even be the same, but uh, in the binary case, they are the same and they are all hanging balls, but in general, they are not necessarily the same. And yeah, this is a geometric interpretation of the same problem. So let me pause here to see if there is any question regarding the model and uh, the question I want to study. Uh, if you don't get it, you will get very bored in the second half of the talk. Okay, I hope it's clear. I'm going to continue. Okay, so uh, I mean, by the way, so feel free to again unmute yourself and shout out your question. I uh, I can address it if I I will address it if I can. So the uh, theorem statement is that this is the answer to the uh, question I just posed. It looks a little bit complicated. Let me pass this uh, properly. It says that uh, the task I uh, post is impossible if and only if the following uh, equation holds. This is a set inclusion equation. So it says that for every feasible input distribution, recall that you know the channel comes with some feasible input uh, set of distributions. For every distribution in that set, this equation holds. What does this mean? On both sides of this equation are 
two sets of distri distributions on L random variables. So this and this are all sets of distributions of the form P of x1, x2, and uh, 2xL, okay? On the right-hand side is the set of bad distributions induced by the, channel, by the channel. If I give you the channel, you can compute this set, in fact, efficiently. And that's uh, some characteristic associated to the channel. These are the bad distributions. On the left-hand side, these are good distributions. For now, it's not clear why I call CP good, but I will tell you why. And it does not have to do with the channel. It's just some, uh, some set of distribution well-defined out there. And I claim they are good. So this theorem statement morally says that this, I, ca I cannot achieve any positive rate if and only if every good distribution is bad for the channel. Now I'm going to uh, specify what I mean by good and bad. So I call this K the confusability set. Uh, is again, the set of distributions. Let me first explain this uh, operationally. Go back to the two least decoding uh, problem. Like, uh, let's use that as a running example through this talk. A two, okay. Uh, two least decodability is violated if we can find three code words, one more than two, such that there exists three code words, as, uh, sorry, three noise vectors, S1, S2, S3, each of type from this lambda s, of course, so that under the channel function, under the action of the channel, they go to the same y. You should think of this as, like in the binary case, the center of the, the pink center of the ball. So this is, you know, literally uh, the violation of two least decodability by the definition of the channel. Now I collect all types of x1, x2, x3 which satisfy this kind of relation. And the type of x1, x2, x3 is you know, a bunch of distributions. I collect all of them, and I call that the set of bad distributions. So why can't I do that? Why can't I work with types rather than the vectors themselves? Because the, fun the channel function acts on each coordinate independently. So it doesn't matter if I permute everything by the same permutation. What's good remains good and what's bad remains bad, right? So if I permute everything uh, using the same permutation coordinate wise, so non-least non decodability remains non-least decodability and vice versa. So I can in general work with distributions or types instead of uh, vectors. Notice that distributions or types are uh, dimension free. It does not depend on N. Uh, morally. Now, uh, mathematically, it, okay, this is a horrible uh, equation, but I'm just describing that relation using equations. So uh, I collect all distributions satisfying, let's look at the third uh, condition. This is the most important one. If I can find a giant distribution P x1 to xl, s1 to sl, and y, these are dummy random variables corresponding to the code word. These are dummy random variables corresponding to the noise. This is the dummy random variable corresponding to uh, the y, like the center in some sense. By the way, I'm using the weird notation like uh, this bold face corresponding to random variables rather than vectors. And I use underline to denote uh, vectors, maybe somewhat unconventional. This is bad if it can be decomposed in this way. It can be decomposed by into this form. This times the channel function times the channel law. Uh, and this should be true for every i. It's like um, w of xi si is equal to y for every i. And I'm describing that using distributions. And for some tech, so that's the most important condition. And uh, yeah. And for some technical technical reason, I assume that uh, each code word in the code has the same type. Like in the binary case, it, it says that I want to work with uh, a code whose, in which all code words have the same uh, Hamming weight. It doesn't matter because there are only n plus one uh, Hamming weights, uh, n plus one possible Hamming weights, but the code size is exponential. So I can, you know, in general, work with a constant weight codes or constant type codes. So it's just small, just some small technicality. 
I use this bracket uh, 2xi denote uh, marginalization onto some random variable. And also, of course, I want each SI to be feasible, namely the type is in lambda s. And okay, I collect those uh, such big distributions and marginalize it to x1 to xl. And I call this the bad set. Uh, so this is, again, literally, it, I collect all uh, the types of all bad tuples. That's a bad set, it depends on W clearly. Now on the left-hand side, as I have alluded to at the beginning of the talk, um, this is the set of CP distribution. But let me tell you why CP is good for this problem. So let's say this is the ambient space and this is the set of um, bad distributions in K. Okay, some you can show that it's actually convex. Let's say, you can find, some, this is K here, given some channel, I can compute it. Let's say you can find some product distribution, P tensor L outside K, then I claim you can construct a large code of positive rate, which is least decodable. Why is that? This is pretty simple because you construct some large code. This is a matrix, you know, each row is a code word and you have M code, word, code words and each of length N you sample each entry of this matrix IID from PX, okay? Now, what happens is that if you take any L tuple, let's say you, you take any triple from this code word, any three uh, rows from this matrix, their joint type is very tightly concentrated around P tensor three. I hope it's clear because, you know, just by concentration, there are some deviations, but never mind that. Namely, all those join type, uh, join types of triples of code words are concentrated around this P tensor three. In particular, they are all outside K. Now, outside K just means that the code is good because I already collected every bad distribution in this K. So if a code avoids this K, then it's good. So I'm, so we have already shown some a similarly trivial statement saying that if we can find a product distribution outside K, then we can achieve positive rate. This is almost one direction of this equation, uh, this statement, because um, we can actually slightly generalize this. If we cannot find, a, find an exactly product distribution outside K, but we can find a distribution which is a convex combination of product distributions, we can achieve the same thing because let's say, Okay, the equation is a bit slow, but uh, is, a, is a bit small, but let me uh, explain this using this figure. So again, we want to construct a large code, uh, a large code book. Let's say I sample, let's say we have a distribution, say one third times P1 tensor three plus one third times P2 tensor three times one third times uh, P3 tensor three. This is a convex combination of product distribution. I sample each coordinate here from P1 IID and each coordinate here from P2 IID and each coordinate here from P3 IID. Now, what will happen if we take, again, a triple of code words, uh, I mean, a triple of rows from this matrix and look at their uh, join type, it's gonna be pretty tightly concentrated around you know, the convex combination of these distributions, which is exactly this, this uh, black dot. It represents a distribution. So all types are around in this ball, in this ball over distributions. In particular, they are outside K. So again, it's a good code. So we have actually already showed that, uh, show, I guess, this direction. So if this is not true, if CP is not completely contained in K, then we can achieve positive rate. Geometrically, it looks like this, oh, by the way, let me form, formally define CP here. Uh, it's just you know the set of distribution that can be written as convex combination of product distributions. Okay. Now the figure looks like this in one direction. Given a channel, again we compute K. It's something associated to the channel, and CP is always there. Some dist uh, some set. If it happens to be like this, CP you know pokes out a little bit of K, then. Uh, we can find some good distribution outside K, so we can achieve positive rate, right? This is already one direction of this statement. Uh, looks pretty trivial. 
Now, what about the other direction? If the channel happens to look like this, K contains CP. I claim you cannot have any large code which is least decodable. Large meaning two to the n times some constant. Why is that? This is uh, much more complicated. So I'm going to, what I'm going to show is that uh, assuming this is the case and I give you any code, uh, assuming that it's somewhat large and I want to derive some contradiction. So let's work with some, let's work with any code, not you know random and so on, just an arbitrary code. I don't know what it looks like at all. Uh, I'm going to first pre-process it a little bit using two steps. The first step I already mentioned, I can work without loss of generality, work out, work with uh, constant type code, just because you know there are only a few uh, types, actually polynomially many types. And I can work with some uh, uh, subcode, which is constant type. So I'm going to call it C, uh, C prime. That's the first reduction, which is pretty simple. I lose a polynomial factor, which is totally fine. The second step is less tr uh, trivial, but it's actually somewhat well known uh, in coding theory. So uh, it goes like this. It says that I can extract some very small subcode from C. Actually, this should be C prime, but uh, anyway, I can extract some very small subcode from C prime, but it's super structured. It's so structured that I can prove nice things about it. So it's just mildly large that, by the way, this is a typo, this should be, there exists some C double prime in C prime. So that first of all, it's very mildly large. For example, if the code C prime has size two to the n point one, for example, maybe this C double prime only has size log, log, log n, something like that. It's only guaranteed that it's increasing in n or in the size of the original code. So mildly large, but it's very structured in the sense that there is a universal uh, distribution, P x1, x2, x3, so that if you take any triple from that subcode, the type of xi1, xi2, xi3 is pretty much P of x1, x2, x3, uh, up to some epsilon. So this is very special. And why is that? Because, you know, again, this is the figure, uh, K contains CP, and I give you a good code, namely, you know, all types are outside K. These dots, this black, sorry, these blue dots are uh, types of triples from the code. Uh, so I can, so yeah, this is the code and I can construct the graph uh, on top of the code and apply hypergraph Ramsey reduction to get this theorem. Let me just quickly flesh out it. Uh, I can uh, draw a graph on top of, let's say five vertices, these are, code words in C prime. And I connect every triple of vertices. So it's a complete three uniform hypergraph. Uh, I collect, uh, it's three uniform because I only care about triples. Now I color each edge using distributions. If the type of a triple is close to some distribution, I color that type, I color that triple using that distribution. So I'm thinking of distribution as colors, right? So I have a lot of uh, triples. Uh, so each triple is colored by a distribution and it's a uniform and, and it's a complete hypergraph. Now by hypergraph Ramsey theorem, you know that there must exist some subset of vertices, which is monochromatic, namely every hyper edge gets the same color. So, and the size of the subcode is actually pretty small. Getting the same color just means that uh, every triple has roughly the same distribution because you know, distribution is viewed as a color. So uh, even if you don't follow this argument, it's okay. The point is that you can get some very small subcode, which is super structured, namely every triple has the same distribution, roughly speaking. Now, uh, I got a very special subcode. I'm going to work with that now. Uh, before doing the actual math, because we saw CP distributions, Let's uh, look at CP and uh, let, me let me introduce some facts about CP, okay? So CP is actually a set of distribution which actually forms a cone. So in general, uh, so we can talk about this dual cone. Let me remind you of the definition of dual cone. 
So actually for any set, not necessarily a cone, we can define it's dual. So for any set A, we can define it's dual to be the set of vectors so that if you take the inner product here uh, between, uh, between this vector here and a vector inside A, the angles banned by these two vectors should be acute. So that's the definition of it. And you collect all such vectors Y. Uh, and it looks like this, this green thing is the dual of A, I call it A star. So in general, uh, sorry, if A itself is a cone, like in our case, it's CP, we can you know, compute its dual cone. In fact, uh, you can compute that ex explicitly. And we call that copy, I mean, not we call, people call it copy, co-positive cone is defined to be the set of distributions so that for every entry-wise non-negative vectors, the inner product between Q and V tensor L is non-negative. So here I'm testing this inner product against entry-wise non-negative vectors. So because it's entry-wise non-negative, so I can normalize it so that it's a distribution, that doesn't matter. So this pretty much reminds us of PSD, right? Because if this V is some just some general vector, this is exactly PSD. You know, the product between this and uh, let's say V tensor V is non-negative. So this is exactly PSD. But now I impose this constraint, which is important, and I call that copy. This expression essentially follows from the observation that the extremal rays of the CP cone is actually those uh, product distributions. So if you take, keep that in mind, you actually get this expression. Now, what can we, uh, why is this duality useful? Because you know we have CP somewhere here and how do we use it? And how, and how do we use that to get some upper bound on the sides of the code? So we are given some code of this kind. So we know that C double prime is good, meaning that you know, again, all types are outside K. Because C double prime is so special, every type is roughly the same as P. So P is also outside K. But K contains CP here. So of course, P is also not, not in CP as well. Now, uh, this fact can be witnessed by some co-P distribution. Uh, this P is not in CP. It can be witnessed by such a Q that such that the inner product between Q and P is strictly negative by definition of copy, right? Because, uh, yeah, this is just by definition. So I got something that is tangible to work with uh, this uh, distribution Q. It witnesses the fact that P is not in this good set of distributions. Okay, now I'm going to do the actual math. Uh, to get a bound on C, I'm going to, for whatever reason, uh, compute or bound from below and from above this strange quantity. So I take a triple from, I mean, I take a tuple from this C double prime and I look at its uh, type, it's some distribution, and I take the inner product with it. Uh, I take its inner product with Q. It's the same Q, you know, the copy I mentioned in the previous slide. And I sum over all such tuple. In fact, I even sum over those repeated tuple, namely xi, xj can be the same, but it doesn't matter, it turns out. I'm going to bound this quantity for whatever reason. Upper bound comes from, you can actually bound each term independently, uh, separately, I mean. So each term can be written as this. I can stick in this P because I know, you know, each tuple is concentrated around P. So it's tempting to stick in some P. Now, the first term is pretty small just because, you know, the difference between these two things is very small. This is something that I can control. I can, you know, make the quantization fine enough so that this term is actually arbitrarily small, some very small constant epsilon. However, the second term is significantly negative you know, it's, it's uh, induced by the geometry, like K contains CP. So this term is very negative. So that um, when the code C is large enough, this term is actually strictly negative. Each term is strictly negative. Well, but there's a slight caveat because this only works for distinct uh, tuple X1 to XL. 
But in fact, for non-distinct tuple, they only contribute to lower order term of this summation. So we are actually fine. So let's ignore that technicality. On the other hand, uh, what about lower bound? Now, there's no, I guess there's no intuition here. You just compute this. This is a summation. This is inner product. We expand it, it's also a summation. Interchange this to summation. And you get exactly this, some, something uh, that looks a little bit complicated. What is PJ? PJ is, you know, we have a code, uh, uh, it's a matrix. And I view each column, uh, the Jth column will induce some empirical distribution, right? That thing, I call it PJ. Recall that each row has the same distribution because I assume it's a constant type code, but each column may induce some, some distribution. I call that PJ. And this expression is equal to this, this inner product between Q and this. But what is this? This is by definition, you know, a convex combination of product distribution, which is CP, which is negative, oh, sorry, which is non-negative by definition of duality. So we get a contradiction provided that uh, the code size is mildly large. It turns out if you work out the math, it just has to be uh, larger than some constant depending on epsilon uh, eta to fight against the, the lower order term that I omitted here then you already get a contradiction. Now, you roll back, you roll back the uh, reduction, two-step reduction. You get that the original size, the code size has to be uh, at most poly n, which comes from the constant type reduction times Ramsey function of this constant. So this thing is a constant only depending on epsilon and eta, doesn't depend on n. Uh, this Ramsey number is huge. It's like two to the two to the two to something, uh, which is like a tower function of height L or something like that. But since the argument is constant, so we apply this thing, it's still a constant. So we are still fine. So we show that the size of the code has to be small, like definitely exponent, sub exponential. So, so even why is the left hand lower bound non negative? So the Qs can have negative entries, right? So just maybe I just missed that part. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but Q comes from co-P, right? Q is a co-positive distribution. Okay. And by definition, uh, the inner product between Q and any product distribution should be non-negative. Oh, That's I see, different. I see, I see. Okay, okay. But this thing, you know, itself is a convex combination of... So somehow we do the computation and we get some CP distribution. Okay, sure, and, sure. Yeah, so the, whereas yeah. px1 to xl is outside co-p, so that's minus eta. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, it seems that we are pulling out of the air some strange bound on c. But anyway, we, we, we did this and, uh, and we are done. But some caveat I've hidden is that this argument only works if the distribution p, you know, here, px1 to xl that we extracted from the code is symmetric because of uh, symmetric means that uh, it's invariant under permutation over x1 to xl, like px123 is equal to px132, something like that. This is true for any permutation because you know those CP and its duality only make sense in the, spa in the ambient space of symmetric distributions. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. Uh, so what about non-symmetric asymmetric distribution? It turns out that actually, if it's asymmetric, automatically the code size has to be small for some separate reasons. This follows from some uh, theorem by Kolmosh. Uh, I should say that this theorem is purely probability theoretic. There's no codes at all, no combinatorics at all. The original paper is devoted to some other problem. The proof is using like, is inspired by ergodic theory and there's nothing combinatorial here, but somehow it you know takes care of this case. And now I guess we are good. We really show that this code size has to be small if the situation is that K contains CP. Now I'm going to skip this. And uh, if you think about it a little bit, if you take out the channel and just look at CP, the statement reg uh, regarding CP versus K is actually equivalent to this. I mean, not equivalent, but implies this statement that I stated at the beginning of the talk. I'm here stating this uh, using general L, but if you can do this for L equals three, you can do it for general L without too much effort. So 
so far, any questions regarding the proof or the uh, statement of the results? Sorry, what did you mean by this PX1 to XL is symmetric? What, what is symmetry of the symmetric joint? Symmetric means uh, if you permute this, like PX1, X2, X3 is uh, invariant under permutation over one, two, three. Oh, the indices. Okay. So like yeah, all the, the things lying inside a ball or anything. Okay, good, good. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So namely, you know, the probability mass on some vector only depends on the weight, for example, in the binary case. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, Okay, any further comments or questions? And I guess this theorem you have here it does not assume symmetry or anything. So, yeah, it doesn't. I mean, you can. So, even though I think in your application you only used it for the symmetric case. So, no, it's like uh, if we don't know the, ex the distribution we extracted is symmetric or not, it can be asymmetric actually. If it, okay. if it is asymmetric, it's automatic, the code has to be automatic. Right, so small. then the C double prime itself is small, so you're done. But but this fact that if you can match the LYs marginals, then you are in ah. the CP. I guess you kind of using that only for the symmetric case. Yes, yes, right. Okay. Right, okay. So I hope we are on the same page. Uh, now I'm going to be more hand weaving the second half of like the very last part of the talk. So, so far we've only talked about thresholds, like uh, the zeroth order characterization of the, uh, of the channel. Oh, sorry, of the capacity. When is the positive, positive? when is it uh, negative? Sorry, when is it uh, zero? But what about the actual value of the capacity? Uh, first of all, there's no hope to get the actual value because it's uh, super difficult, even if, uh, even in the binary case, it corresponds to Hamming, uh, sorry, sphere packing Hamming space, which is widely open. We don't know the capacity anywhere except in, except in two uh, trivial cases. Uh, but we can, you know, generalize existing good bounds. You know, there are many wise bounds in the literature and they are pretty good. And we can, here, what we did is that we can generalize them in a very general setting so that if I give you any channel, uh, like no matter uh, whether it's, you know, the XOR channel, the Z channel and so on, you, there is a mechanical way to derive bounds uh, following, you know, uh, old but gold uh, ideas. Like lower bounds follow from, for example, random coding with expurgation is pretty standard. I'm not going to talk about it any, at all. It's just that you sample code words IID and you carefully remove those bad ones. And you analyze that uh, process and you get some lower bound. So I'm going to just skip this. Some upper bound, this might be slightly, this might be more interesting actually. So the idea, First of all, don't read this formula, it's complicated. And the idea is actually very simple. Uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, flesh out the idea using a figure. Let's say we have some uh, code and I want to, I don't know what it looks like. I just want to derive some upper bound on the size of the code, provided that it is least decodable. So the idea by Elias Basaligo is that this is the space uh, of sequences whose type is, uh, equal to px. I said that we can work with this. And we have a bunch of points in this space. And they are guaranteed to be least decodable. And, but how many points can we pack? The idea is that we first cover the space using some balls. Actually, it's not ball, but it's some set. But I drew here using balls because it's intuitive. Balls around uh, sequences u over some alphabet script u. For now, you can think of u, script u to be the same as script u, but in general, actually, they can be different. And these u's are you know, auxiliary, um, like covering sequences. I drew balls, I draw balls around this u so that they cover the whole space. I want the following property. If I you know, take out any, uh, tiling, any tile of the, uh, of the covering, it's guaranteed that you know, the center of the tile is u. I want it to be the case that every code word in this uh, ball x, namely those black points, has a uh, join type with u equal to px, equal to some distribution p of u x, which is equal to px times some p of u given x. So px is just this px, which is fixed. This p of u given x is associated to the covering, which is some design parameter actually. 
each p of u given x this defines a covering, okay? This is something I want to tune. I want to tune it in such a way that each ball can only contain finitely many points that is that are least decodable. So I want to adjust this distribution, which defines the covering, so that each ball uh, in the covering only support a finitely many points. But this question was already answered because this is a threshold question, right? I want so what kind of distribution p of u given x gives rise to, you know, uh, capacity zero code? Like if we restrict ourselves to this subcode, it has capacity zero. We know what condition it should satisfy. And now, uh, by the way, yeah, okay, let me skip that. Now, the size of the whole code is just the number of balls, like the size of the packing, times the number of points in each uh, ball which is the, the covering number times a constant because you know, each tile supports a finitely number of points. Now we see that the rate we can achieve is just the exponent of this covering number, but covering is easier than packing. We actually understand covering completely. We know the fundamental limits. It's actually given by this exponent and it's actually tight. You cannot do better than this. So, you see that the objective of this maxi mean is this thing. And this beautiful idea is like dividing, is decomposing the hard problem of bounding a packing into two simpler problems. One is covering, which we understand. The other is the threshold, which is also simpler because we also understand like by the previous, the half, the first half of the talk. So I think this is nice. Now, uh, one more thing maybe. I'm almost out of time, but uh, we don't understand, again, we don't understand the capacity for any finite L is, is large, but we understand the limit if L goes to infinity. And this also follows from standard techniques. Uh, the meaning of this result is just that if you operate at a rate slightly below this number, you can achieve uh, this C up to delta, provided that the least size is one over delta. It's large, but it's a constant independent of n. On the other hand, if you're above, if you're above this threshold, this capacity C, the least size has, has to be exponential in n, so which is truly bad. Let me skip this. Okay, finally, I want to mention some, this, this is actually, I saw this thing when I prepared this talk uh, last week, and I saw this thing in a paper by, uh, okay, let me mention this later. So. Uh, let's look at least recovery. So in the classical notion of least recovery, it means the following thing. Uh, what does least recovery mean? It means that if we have a query code, it's least recovery, uh, you know, there are three parameters, P, small L, and capital L. So this small L is one more parameter. If uh, for every sequence of subsets of Q, each of size small L, we have you know, one subset of size L for each coordinate. We have N such things. The number of bad code words with respect to this sequence of subsets of input symbols is at most L minus one. So it looks pretty much like list decoding, except that uh, those Y1 to Yn, those coordinates of the center now becomes actually subsets of symbols. Now, what does it mean for a code word to be bad with respect to this sequence of symbols. It means that the fraction of coordinates that hit this, the corresponding subset is at most MP. So XI is in BI, the number of such coordinates is at most MP. So if you take each BI to have size one, this corresponds to exactly this decoding because, I mean, in the curious case, because, uh, those bi's are just y1 to yn. These are just coordinates of the uh, center y. And this quantity is just nothing but the Hamming distance from a code word x to the center y. And the Hamming distance is too small, is at most mp. It means that if I draw a ball of radius mp around y, it captures you know less than l minus one points. So I so, think you want xi not in bi, but small typo. So. Yeah, okay. You're right, actually, yeah, you're right. Otherwise, it's not least. Uh, it's not Hamming weight. Uh, sorry, Hamming distance. Yeah. So 
you see that it's a generalization of this decoding in the classical notion. But I claim, uh, my take is that it's a special case of this decoding because uh, in my language, I can cook up some channel so that if you do list decoding for that channel, it's equivalent to list recovery. Uh, let me use, uh, explain this quickly using an example. Let's say Q is equal to three uh, for it to be non-trivial. Let's say small L is equal to two and this size is just some, uh, some number, fixed number. I claim that uh, if we look at this channel, carefully uh, designed, the input symbols are one, two, three. The output symbols are subsets of one, two, three of size two. So we have you know, Q choose L number of output symbols and I connect them using these uh, errors. And I'm going to charge the adversary by one. If he uses an error of this kind, it sends one input symbol to some output subset, which does not contain this input symbol. So I'm going to charge the adversary if he makes such an error, which sends one to two, three, which does not contain one. So there are three such errors, right? Uh, uh, those black ones. I'm only going to charge uh, the adversaries if he uses these uh, errors. I want him to use at most MP number of such errors across N coordinates. And I claim, so I basically give you some you know, uh, noise constraint. And I claim if you do list decoding over this channel, it's equivalent to list recovery. Why am I saying this? Because when I prepared this talk, I came across this paper by Venkat Grusmami, Jonathan Moshev, Nicholas Resch, Shashwat Silas, and Mary Wutus. They ask this question, uh, what is the plotting point of list, list recovery? Namely, if I, uh, you know, I care about PL, L minus one Q list recovery, was the largest fraction of errors so that the list recovery capacity is positive. So what they did is that they study sharp thresholds of random codes. So they said that, okay, I'm only going to, I don't know the capacity in general, but I care about random codes. So let me study, you know, high probability bounds of random codes. I set up a random code, I study the fundamental limits of that. So uh, not surprisingly, it exhibits some uh, sharp transition, like phase transition. If the rate of the code is slightly below some threshold, they determine that threshold exactly. If it's below that, then the code is good for this least recovery with high probability. Otherwise, if the code size is above that threshold, it's going to be bad for this task with high, with high probability, but doesn't mean with probability one. And then they ask that, is that threshold given by their random code construction tight in general? Uh, I mean, in particular, what's the, uh, the value of uh, P? Is that tight in general given by uh, their uh, bounds using random code construction? I uh, don't think it's tight because for finite uh, small L and finite L minus one, we need expurgation because they also have results for random linear codes, uh, the threshold turns out to be different. So uh, I don't think that's uh, uh, tight, but what exactly is that, that value? Uh, I think this in principle is already answered, but uh, not fair to say that because uh, we have results for general channels in principle, given by that CP versus K relations, but I should say that that relation is not in general easy to evaluate. We managed to do it for you know, like classical settings for many well-studied cases, but if you give me some exotic channel, I don't quite, I mean, I can do it, do the computation numerically, but uh, I'm not sure if I can give you the e explicit expression, but uh, I think uh, one can work this out using that uh, like CP versus K relation but I didn't do the calculation carefully yet. So uh, yeah, if any of the authors here in the audience are interested, I can get back to you later if, if anything interesting pans out. So, okay, I listed some sev several uh, extensions and future directions, but I'm not sure it's proper to talk about here because these things are heavily information theoretic. Let me skip them for the time being and just mention that I guess the most the biggest open question is to find more applications because recently I realized that 
this framework is like maybe too general that we actually don't quite understand some of the uh, aspects. So yeah, it'll be nice if we can find more applications and see uh, its real power. And so with this, I'm uh, going to yeah end the talk and I'm happy to take final questions and comments and so on. Thank you. Yeah, I have to run, Ihan, but great talk. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I'll follow up with an email. I had some thoughts. So. Okay, sure. Thank you. Yeah, any final like questions or comments or whatever? Yeah, this might be somewhat far from like this CS audience because I came from a slightly different community, but uh, but anyway. <laughs>